Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive of the RSA, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's special event. It's really a great privilege to be joined by two of Britain's most admired public intellectuals, Mary Beard and David Olishoga. Mary and David will be well known to everyone watching, I'm sure. Mary is a well-known classicist, and David is a pioneering public historian of race, slavery, and empire. In their award-winning work for the page and the screen, they combine deep scholarship with compelling storytelling power. By shedding vivid new light on our past, they offer us new ways to understand ourselves, each other, and the world around us in the here and now. So, David, Mary, welcome. It's really a special privilege to be joined by such brilliant thinkers to help us make sense of the moment we're all living through. We first had the idea of bringing you together when we spotted an exchange you had on Twitter a few weeks ago following the Black Lives Matter protests in the UK and the felling of the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol. You seem to kind of hold differing views on the statues debate in recent years, but that exchange led to the kind of sense that you might be moving a bit closer together, or at least at least that there's a kind of compromise position you might be able to hammer out. So today we're giving you a space to try and do that in person. David, can, can I start with you? In the past weeks, there's been a, a lot of airtime given to you know, pretty well rehearsed arguments in the debates around statues and the politics of memory. But even so, it'd be great if you could share again how it felt for you watching the Colston statue fall that weekend, why it was so significant for you and for the city of Bristol. And how it compares with previous flashpoint moments in recent years. I wonder what you think the felling of that statue means for how far as a nation we've come and how far we still have to go. Well, watching those events was watching an impossibility happen in front of your eyes. At the end of last year, the debate in Bristol, people I know were heavily involved in and I was you know, tapped into, was whether or not we might be able to get a contextualization plaque added to the plinth, the pedestal on which Colston stood, that made mention of the people who are utterly invisible in this whole memorialization of Colston, which are the tens of thousands of people who are enslaved um, by the Royal African Company when Colston was involved and the probably around 20,000 people who died in the process, either in the Middle Passage or in the slave raids um, or in the other you know, many manifest horrors of the slave trade. Now, even that quite meagre, modest ambition of having the victims of Colston mentioned on the, on the, the pedestal was thwarted and it was rebuffed by the people who defended him. So I presume that I would never in my lifetime see that statue come down. So for it to come down instantly, overnight, in a kind of dramatic uh, way was an incredible experience. And what I found was when I spoke to other black Bristolians, and you know, I live in Bristol, lived here longer than anywhere I've ever lived. Um, so I will give myself the title Bristolian without being offered it. Um, I found myself very emotional. And I think what we've, we've learned in the weeks since is that statues are very important. And people constantly in this debate say, oh, you're wasting your time, talk about something else, why aren't you deb debating this issue? Statues are taking up all the airtime. Well, I think what we discovered was that the removal of that statue was not the end of the, of the process. What began was a process of what I've called de -colstonification. There's around 20 institutions and street names and other uh, ways in which Colston's remembered in this city. And institution after institution found themselves in the days after that statue's toppling, able to do things that they were unable to do the week before, which was to dis disassociate themselves from a mass killer. The concert hall had already decided it was going to change its name, but it took its name off, off its facade, as did an office block, Colston Tower. The school is now consulting on changing its name. Another school is consulting on changing its name. Institution after institution found themselves able to act in a way that they, they just were incapable of doing a few, a few days earlier. So that effect was, was catalytic in a way that I didn't expect. And, and David, before I come, before I bring in Mary, to, to what extent, when you watch that happening in Bristol, do you feel that each of those incidents is one in which the institution is thinking deeply, reconsidering deeply, learning, or to what extent is it simply that this has now become a kind of shifted norm, and you know, woe betide you if you don't respond because you'll be seen 
to be a racist? Or, and, and, and does that matter, actually? Do you care whether or not people are just doing it because it feels like you have to do it or they're doing it as a process, through a process of thought? Well, I can't speak for the thought processes and the discussions within organisations that I'm not privy to. But what I would, I would like to think is that this has gone a bit deeper, is that they've looked at the passion, they've looked at the directness with which those protesters targeted a single statue in that city. They didn't, this wasn't thuggery, which is what the right-wing press would like us to believe. If that were the case, there's a statue of Edmund Burke nearby, there's other statues, all of them were untouched, as was every shop window and shop front or places that could have been looted. It wasn't thuggery, it was very targeted political protest. Um, and I think what institutions have looked at is that this isn't just a, a change in the political wind. This is a change of consciousness, and it's brought about by a generational shift. And what I hope happened is that the morning after, people woke up and thought, what have we been doing? Defending a mass murderer for all of these years. His toppling allowed a clarity of thought that just had been obscured and blurred um, before the toppling. And I, I'd like to think that people suddenly realized that this wasn't worth it, that this, this drawing a line in the sand over someone who just didn't deserve it, who was not worthy of this level of defense and protection was a losing battle and not really, not just one that they were gonna lose, but one that wasn't worth morally fighting. Thank you so much to come back to there. But Mary, I'll turn to you. you you had a pretty clear position on the Cecil Rhodes statue when the campaign for its removal first began several years ago. I'm, I'm interested in how your views have changed since then, if they have. You said you were happy to see Colston fall. Yeah, so of course. I was, um, tell us about the distinction was, between Rhodes and Colston. I was Colston. delighted, and I, I think the problem about this for me is that there isn't a... You know, and, this is where why we never go to dis to agree entirely. There's no hard and fast rule. There's no set of criteria which says you know X falls and Y doesn't. Um, I felt very much like David that I'd watched much more distantly the debates about Colston and seen an on pass happening. I mean, there was you know I I'm extremely keen on the idea of interventions with these old guys standing up there. Sometimes removal, sometimes additions, sometimes a contextualization. Um, that seems to me wholly good. And as far as I could see, that had gone on for months, if not years. You know, and in the end, I, I felt too, when I watched it, I felt exhilaration that someone in the end said, enough is enough, we're getting rid of him. Now, you know, I have, you know, all the sort of slightly um, old lady views about direct action, and I worry about that, but I, you know, I have to confess, I thought, right, you know, done it. And, and I think that for me, the, the point is that, you know, I, I have different views on different statues, and then some, some I disagree with, David. I think that you know, the bottom line is that there isn't a single person in the world who's not a sociopath of some sort, um, who wants, who thinks that every statue should remain up. Right? You know, if we had a statue of Goebbels in the centre of Reading, you know, he would not be there any longer. Right. So, you know, it's not a question of saying to remove any statue is to remove or to erase history. It's not. Sometimes the removal of a statue is the creating of a new history, um, which I'm which I'm very happy to be part of. I suppose what I worry about is, you know, in a sense where, you know, where on the spectrum any one statue falls, how we make our minds up or even without going to the Trump side, what we might lose when we lose some of these, these people in our midst. And I, I went back and I looked at the Bristol newspapers in 1895 when Colston statue was erected. And, you know, Bristol was a sort of Gladstonian town. And reading, I, you know, I have, I was not party, I, could only guess what the arguments had been behind it. And I looked at the way he was being honored hundreds of years after he died um, as a philanthropist by people who did, who I thought were not constitutively blind to slavery, but somehow just 
passively didn't see it. You know, they, they were getting together to celebrate this guy in a sort of late Victorian civil, civic occasion. And I suppose what made me think is, my question is how could they have done it? You know, when those guys and some women got together and they cheered and they were pleased, what was going through their minds and why did they, how was it that they did not see what we saw? see now. And I thought, and more to the point, I thought, and what is it? He reminds me, and that occasion reminds me, of all the things that we're not seeing about ourselves and our own morality, which will in one day um, be as um, abominated as that of Colston. And I, I, I kind of think that these statues are much more dialogic than people give them credit for. You know, they, they are about challenging us. One thing you can say is, is they don't have agency. They're just a piece of metal and we can just pull them down. You know, so, you know, we have the power here, not them. But, you know, I think of, you know, I think of myself slightly cheering on the the removal of Colston statue with my mobile phone in my pocket, which was made by child labour that is as close to slavery as anything, in some place I can't see. And I, 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 I always have this sense that these, you know, old blokes, and they're mostly blokes, and I, you know, and you know, there's hardly single one of them I'd want to sit down and have dinner with, you know, let alone approve of their, um, of their politics and morality. They're constantly challenging me to think, what will I look like in 200 years' time? What am I doing that's going to seem as uh, absolutely outrageous as them? They're part of the dialogue with the, the past and the present. Now, the problem in Bristol was, that, as David said, the fact that there was no further kind of attempt at contextualization meant that that dialogue was kind of stopped. But I, I you know, I very much like the idea of them challenging us about our own selves as much as we want to challenge them. I and mean, you know, look at look at Charles the First outside Charing Cross. You know, <laughs> what's he doing? Well, actually, in some ways, you know, he reminds me that you know, some form of democracy, limited as it was, won in this country. You know, we're, we're not sitting there putting reeds in front of his statue. So there's there's a much more complicated relationship between the statue and our own politics and morality than I think comes out in the debate. That said, I was jolly keen and pleased and cheered and enjoyed a drink when Colston fell. So, so David, we, 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 we have agreement about, uh, about Colston and that, that that tearing of that statue was not only welcome, but also it, it, it important. In terms of what Mary said, as a historian, it, it, in what ways do you want to qualify a kind of view that... Uh, anybody of the past who behaved in ways which are clearly unacceptable now should, as it were, that we should not in any sense commemorate them or that we should entirely condemn them. I, I, I'm interested in, 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 in what your view would be of, 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 of that kind of, kind of, a view of history which I, I would imagine you would find reductive. Absolutely. I'm not for the removal of all statues, and that would be ridiculous, but I'm also not for the retaining of all statues, and everybody, whether they admit it or not, is somewhere along that spectrum. It's very easy to think of political, historical figures that anyone would reject a statue of or would want one removed if, if, they, if they could find it. So everybody's somewhere in this spectrum, and nobody is a, a purist saying all statues should stand or all statues should fall. And I think all statues following on, you know, the obvious corollary of that is that every case should be taken as an as an individual case. And absolutely, I also think that the idea that our age wanting a statue to be removed or to be contextualized is not us saying that our morals are right. And, I, and I've written and thought a lot about what about this age will future generations 
find outrageous about us. I mean, I read documents by people in the 18th century, and you you look at their their double think about slavery. Good, decent, Christian, incredibly moral people in lots of ways who are slave traders. Um, I think our age will have the same um, contradictions. I think our relationship with the natural world, our failure to seize this moment to stop the climate crisis will will be condemned by other gen- future generations who will live with the consequences and will rage against our refusal to give up on some of the luxuries that we have when the science was telling us that we had to. I think our relationship with animals and factory farming will be seen as an abomination by future generations. They will judge us the same as we judge people of of the past, but the way we judge them and the arena in which we judge them is through history. Statues are another thing. They're about memorialization. And I think that's, this is where this debate gets lost. Pulling down a statue is not erasing the past because statues aren't about the past. Statues are about the memorialization of men who at a certain point in their history, 175 years after his death, in the case of Colston, people decided should be memorialized. And this debate about statues has brought out all sorts of hidden histories about where these statues actually came from. And Mary's written about this really well. What I find fascinating, looking at some of the pictures from the American South, is that you have Americans from the baby boomer generation standing out in front of statues, defending statues of Confederate generals, when those statues are younger than many of the protesters, and they're defending them as if they're objects of history. They are younger than most of the people protesting, because they were put up in the 60s in a response to a moment when the, the, uh, the version of the Civil War that had been created in Reconstruction in the 1870s was challenged. So this idea that statues represent history when sometimes they're younger than the people worried about the loss of history, I think shows the complexities here. It's not a simple debate, but I think there's an important distinction. There are people like, say, Nelson. There's two sides to the ledger on Nelson. He was one of the greatest uh, naval tacticians the world has ever seen. He was a brilliant commander, and he was someone who had a view on the slave trade I wish he hadn't had an involvement in uh, the uh, through family, through marriage, with slavery, I wish he hadn't had. But there's two sides. You can't pretend one of those doesn't exist. So should Nelson's statue come down? I don't think it should. But I think when we teach Nelson, we should say he was involved in a Royal Navy that was also at that point defending the slave trade, right up until 1807, when a very small proportion of the Royal Navy then was deployed condemning and, and, uh, and suppressing the slave trade. So it's complicated. But the problem is, problem is statues aren't complicated. They're simple. They say one thing. Here so I, uh, that's where I, I disagree with you. Uh, uh, the epiphenomenon, but, but I think in broad terms, agree with you that I, I think that, you know, for, for people as citizens in the urban environment, the statues are part of their dialogue with the past, whether you want to call that history, it's how they relate to the past, it's how they think of their own position in relation to both the time the statue was put up or the era of the person commemorated. But I think that what it kind of raises for me, and this has come out a bit in the debates, but I think not enough, is that it and you know, I, here I'm absolutely definitely not sitting down and blaming school teachers for this. You know, I'm blaming us all, uh, how we think history, what it's about in this country and how it's disseminated. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that partly with the pressure from, from some governments, there has been a, a, a very strong push to to see the you know the great history of our island story and, and in a sense to go back to the kind of thing that I learned when I was a kid which was you know almost 60 years ago you know it, it took me about it wasn't until I was about 40 that I realized that Sir Francis Drake was not just a guy who'd saved Britain from the Spaniards and done a bit of exploring you know i I had no clue. I'm quite, uh, you know, I'm quite interested in that kind of thing, but I still was left with that feeling of uh, both a white Britain and an imperial Britain um, that, that was always mitigated and without the nasty bits. And I think one of the saddest things that I saw 
in the whole kind of era of, of the statue wars was two middle-aged-ish Boy Scouts um, kind of standing guard around a statue of Baden-Powell. Um, uh, clearly horrified, outraged and upset that there should be any kind of um, uh, uh, opposition to a person that for all their life in the Scouts, which looked as if it was well over 20 years, um, they had been treating as their founding father. Nobody had ever said to them, look, there's all sorts of things you can admire about Baden Powell, and there's all sorts of things that are problematic. And you know, it was back to the Carlylean view that there are some great heroes of the British nation out there, um, and we don't examine them. And it, you know, this isn't a question uh, in in getting people to talk about history of sort of, in many cases, really toppling them. So it's as David said, recognizing that these people are flawed human beings. They think things that we don't. They did some things that we're grateful for, um, and they did some things of which we fundamentally disapprove. But we don't disseminate, and this is not just schools, this is, you know, in novels and fiction and whatever. We don't disseminate a complicated view of the past. We disseminate a simple view of the past. Uh, we're reaping the rewards of that simplistic view, I think. That's exactly what's happening. I'm sorry, Mary and I are doing a very bad job at having a row and disagreeing with each other here. Um, I entirely you agree want with you. have a row. <laughs> that statues have become the cipher, and they're problematic in countries that haven't dealt with their history. Countries that have been creating a single heroic narrative, they're the nations for whom this moment and these statues are, are, are problematic because, you know, Nelson becomes problematic because we haven't talked about his involvement in slavery. Baden-Powell becomes a problem because we haven't talked about the, should we say, unfortunate parts of his character and his military record. It wouldn't be a problem if anyone knew this. Um, and these statues would become a lot less totemic in a country that was confronting its the good and the bad of history. And this is a very specific problem, I think, with, with Britain. Because, I mean, what I find myself in public talks a lot saying one of two things must be pop must be true either we are the only country that has never done bad things the only country in history and we are incredibly fortunate to be citizens of it that has always been on the right side of history or Britain's a country like any other and it's done good things and bad things and just logically which of those is true and if you believe in the latter then both good things and bad things and good people and bad things sometimes in the same person will be manifest in our heritage yeah and um, can, mary before you before you come back in can can i just i mean david said that i'd be disappointed not having a row i mean absolutely not um but you're both very brave in the sense that you're on Twitter and you're both subject to, you know, kind of horrible, not from time to time, you're, sub you're, 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 you're subject to, to pretty unpleasant comments. It, what is there that we can do in the relation to this debate so that it's more like the conversation that you and Mary are having and it's less like the incredibly kind of charged debate, which seems to be going with, 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 you know, rage and judgmentalism and a kind of sense that, you know, and I don't want to exaggerate this, but a sense I think that people have who don't fully get it, that, that there's a danger that if they say the wrong thing, that they will be, you know, that, that they will, it, it will reveal them not to understand what's going on at all. Mary, start with you. What can we do to improve the quality of this discourse? And, I, and in that, I don't mean to reduce the emotion from it because the emotion is powerful and real, as David uh, described. But how, how do we do? How do we debate it better? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I think it's it's interesting that one one of not the worst, but one of the worst Twitter pilings I had was when I I said on television what David has just said. You know that Britain's an ordinary country, and. Um, you know, what we should aspire to be is a good ordinary country. And blimey, you know, <laughs> about unpatriotic um, and, a, and a lot, lot worse than the adjective ad unpatriotic. You know, and I, I think there, and it, it's not clear to me, I think there is a connection between all the kind of, there must be, you know, how could there not be a connection between the kind of social and political movements that we're seeing now? 
Um, and I think that it is too easy. I am, uh, I'm of course sort of, because I've suffered and um, I suspect, I know that David suffered too, um, and probably a lot worse than me. Um, you know, I am sympathetic to an anxiety about so-called cancel culture and pilings, etc. But I think it's much more complicated than it is being represented to be. And I mean, I think one thing for sure is that we're not, however much it would be nice to kind of cast this as a debate between freedom of speech baby boomers and a, a kind of intolerant woke generation on the left. It's, it's got... It's much, much more complicated and interesting than that. For a start, people, you know, the right is perfectly capable of piling in and does and demands people's resignations and dismissals. You know, this is not a, this is not a political thing. But I think we, we've got to a point now that social media is much more embedded than it was when the conversation is um, both less nuanced because of the medium in which it's taking place, not because people are less nuanced, but because it's hard to be nuanced in 240 characters if you're on Twitter. But also it's, you know, lots of people, thank heavens, are able to join in the conversation. And, but we don't know what difference that means. I mean, the British press is terribly, terribly preoccupied with the idea of free speech on campus. And I think there have been some, you know, really bad individual issues about with people being no, no platformed. I think not as many as is painted, but you feel uncomfortable. But I think what they forget, for heaven's sake, is that and if you're just thinking in terms of a university and then you can magnify it, um, it's, it's very easy to have free speech in a university when it's all posh white boys um, from the same schools in the early 20th century and when the stakes of their disagreement are low because, in a sense, they're all part of the same club, then we can all disagree and, you know, have our glass of claret later. We're dealing with with a way in which... Uh, we're wanting a conversation that isn't restricted to that, that is, that is a vast conversation, which doesn't yet have, you know, even now doesn't have in very many, um, in, in, I don't mean literal, I mean implied rules. You know, what, what should we be doing in tw on Twitter? Well, you know, I, I think we shouldn't be doing quite a lot of things that we are doing and what people call David and what people call me. I mean, you think... Yeah, you know, well, this is what technological progress was for. Um, but in a, in a way, there is a, a widening of the debate and a widening of access to a public forum. Um, and that is going to be a bit uncomfortable um, for people like me um, because, you know, for most of my life, I've had a reasonable access. To, to, to making my views known. Um, and I, I don't know that we've got an answer to that yet. Um, and you know, so, you know, with the people writing to um, Harper's on uh, about council culture, I feel some sympathy with them. You know, you know, of course I feel some sympathy. Um, they're stating a lot of things in which I fundamentally believe that, um, that you need to debate arguments, not put them on the carpet. But I think just to finish for letting, uh, not monopolizing this, but I, mean, I look at my own students now and it, I, I find it very, very irritating that some of them, not many, but a few will say, I don't want to read Ovid's Metamorphoses because it's about rape. Um, and uh, I want to explain to them and to encourage them that actually we have to think about what, Ovid writing, you know, endless books about rape meant, what, how we understand that, what it means to us, whether we can still read it, etc. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I, I try not to lose my temper, but I almost do. You know? <laughs> so, if you want to understand Renaissance, you've got to read this, mate. Uh, um, but then I think, 
look, these kids are objecting. You know, one thing they realised, they realised that Ovid's Metamorphoses is about rape. When, when I read it, when I was first of all at school and then at university, we never mentioned the word rape. You know, we said it was about ravishing. And that was all right. And I think, so part of the objections and, the, and, and they're irritating, you know, to, you know, the old and the old have got a right to say they're irritated. We don't kind of lose our right to speak just because we're 65. But uh, we, we've got to recognise that these, some of these objections, a lot of them are coming from the right places. And they're the places that we share in part. We don't necessarily share the modality but we share the aspirations. And I think at the moment it's a real mess. And you know, I, I, I follow the example of Professor Olashoka and I try only to get cross with wit on social media and just try to keep arguing um, with as much nuance as you possibly can and not lose people. Because part of, you know, part of this public debate is... It's the gutter. It really is the gutter. So, David, there's a there's there's a lot there, and and I'm particularly interested in, in kind of the degree to which you feel that this moment, which can feel quite febrile um, as well as passionate, is is a is an important transition, as it were, to a point at which the debate has shifted. But yet, it can be a debate which everyone can participate in, or or or, or whether in a sense, we're moving simply to a time when people's passions are so strong that we're going to have to get used to this kind of tenor of debate. I, I, what, what's your view of that? Well, I'm always um, entertained when I hear on television or in a newspaper column from someone who's been cancelled, complaining about their being cancelled in a national newspaper column <laughs> or news night um, with, with no sense of irony. Um, there's an idea which I find really interesting, which, which is that we've just lived through the period of the 90s and the, 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 the first part of the decade that followed that was an unusually, um, an unusual time of consensus, that, that we, we, a big chunk of our recent lives were in a period that if you compare it to the 70s or the 60s, was actually a period, um, a quite relaxed period, a period of consensus. And I think if you'd snapped from the sort of the the you know 1968 to now, you wouldn't notice much change in the sort of tenor and the, and how febrile debate is. I think we actually had we had quite an easy time in the 90s and, and the noughties, and that this in some ways is back to normality. And in some ways, the 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 aberrant period was the 90s and the and the the noughties up until the the crash of 2008 when things were quite calm this maybe this is the way most of history history is and we just didn't we 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 got used to things being a bit calmer but i think you know mary's right we have new technologies that we're learning how to use if you were going to uh compare this to the uh the pamphlet craze of the uh, of, of of the the georgian era i don't think things being said today online are any more um, scurrilous or offensive than some of the most exciting Georgian, Georgian pamphlets. It was people using a new technology uh, which allowed all voices in, or many voices, not all in the case of the pamphlets, um, though many were privately privately printed. Um, and that means that, you know, here comes everybody. It's more, it's, it's more scurrilous, it's more aggressive. And we're trying to work out how to use these technologies. And that means you're going to get voices of people who aren't there to debate ideas, who aren't there to be reasonable, who don't even really care about the ideas. They want to send a tweet to someone like Mary to try to offend her. And I should say on Twitter, you know, I think I get my fair share of abuse. In my observation of Twitter is you have to be one of two things to really get the full broadside of how vile it can be, and that is female and Muslim. Yeah. yeah. I think that uh, Mary, can I? Sorry, but I, I, if, if you don't mind, I'd just like to move us on to to uh, to, to, to to a, another topic. And I'm being slightly cheeky, and I'd like to come to you first, David. But we at the RSA are reflecting on our own uh, history. Uh, you know, like a lot of organisations, when we talked about our history until actually a few weeks ago, which shows the incredible power of this moment. You know, we did it in a reasonably unthinkingly positive way. You know, and we have our Benjamin Franklin room and we have our Folkestone room and our Shipley room and 
you know, and, and we say one of the great things about the R- I, I've often said as a chief executive, I have said one of the great things about the RSA is our history. Well, I don't think I'll be saying quite that again in quite those terms again. So, David, with you first, as we embark and we're asking our own historian who's just published a great book about the RSA's history to, 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 to think more deeply about these questions, the ways in which our history is implicated in relation to slavery, slavery colonialism, and what other expressions of racism. I'm interested in your thoughts about how we should go about that, what might be the kinds of principles that we should apply to a bit of historical self-examination like that. Well, I think I mean, there's a bad habit to overcome, which is that we've done out of multiple motivations. We've just edited out the nasty bits. Mm. Um, we've told people's life stories. Yeah. Um, and just when it got to a bit we didn't want to talk about it, we haven't mentioned it. There was a series made um, by the BBC a few years ago about, uh, about Gothic literature, and it mentioned William Buckford of Font Hill, every detail of his life, his enormous art collection, his wealth, the building of a folly uh, in the West Country. It didn't mention that the money came from 3,000 enslaved human beings. This habit of just editing out the bits that are discom- discomforting or seeing them as a separate history that are not worthy of mention in what we call what we might think of as mainstream history is a habit we need to break out of. But I think there's another way of talking about the history of institutions and nations that we need to to get into. And I was talking to the um, the scientist Adam Rutherford recently, and his his phrase, which is a great phrase, is we we shouldn't be as institutions be unquestionably proud of our history, but we can in most cases be proud of the trajectory of our history. And I think that's the way we need to be to be thinking about things. We are moving most institutions in the right direction, and we can be proud of that. But the history itself, we have to confront where the money came from, what these men, and they almost almost always are men, what they did. And I think here it's much more important to talk about what people did rather than what they thought. I'm much more interested in the activities, the financial investment activities, the involvement in colonialism and and slavery than people holding racist ideas. Because I'm afraid a lot of the people who I would say were on the right side of those movements, including many of the abolitionists, held racial ideas. So it's much more uh, an audit of people's activities and their investments than their views. What about about reparation and apology, David? I'm interested in you know, if, if, if when we do this history and we discover, as I'm sure we will, that those bad parts and we want to talk about them, if I'm still chief executive of the RSA when that piece of work is finished, in, who, in what way is it useful for me, for example, to apologise? Who am I apologising for? Is that a tokenistic act or is it a meaningful act? And also, in terms of reparations, how might we think about that? I know these, I'm not asking you specifically to comment on the RSA, but the general principle. Well, I think there's a coming together of history and the consequences of history here, which I think provide an an arena for opportunity. When organizations look into their past and they discover financial connections to slavery, which means benefits from slavery or imperialism, that the exploitation of other people historically is part of the financial DNA that created the wealth of of a current organization, well, they have to look at the other legacy of those institutions, slavery or imperialism, which is that they created ideas and they created uh, normalizations of attitudes which are still impacting upon the life chances of our fellow citizens. So that financial inheritance and that inheritance of ideas and racism and the damage that it does, to me they naturally wire together and that I think institutions have a duty and I would go as far as to, sit, to use the word duty, when they discover these financial investment um, connections, to think about how they can use some of that money to try to address that other form of legacy, the legacies that we know by every possible criteria you can imagine, that people who are the descendants of enslaved people, that people who've come from nations that have been had the enormous uh, uh, discontinuity in their history that is imperialism, that we can find ways of investing in their futures. And I think, you know, Glasgow University's um, approach here, I think, has been been a model that if you discover these financial connections, then there's a reparations that can be done in terms of improving the life chances of people who are living with the consequences of of the ideas that flowed from those historical events. 
And Thank you, Mary. I wonder what, we're running out of time, Sandy, but I, I wonder whether you want to add anything to David's advice for how we should go about yeah, this. I mean, I think there's, there's two things I want to add. I mean, one is I absolutely agree. And I think that there is something which is different about transatlantic slavery from ancient slavery. You can see people uh, putting all this together in a single pot. Now the difference is, we're not talking about a moral difference here, but the difference is that transatlantic slavery, the consequences are still with us. The slavery of the Greeks and Romans, they are only still with us as consequences, extremely indirectly. So um, I, I think there is a, a, a real kind of, um, a, real reparation there, which you can think about, which is more than and more meaningful, certainly, than just kind of atoning for something naughty that you did a long time ago. But I, I think that the other important point is, I think, about what people thought. Because, I mean, I think that I, I feel much less comfortable uh, when I see um, people having names removed from buildings or whatever because they are known to have upheld eugenic principles in the late 19th century. You think of, you know, first of all, you think of the scientific community in the late 19th century. You know, that is what they were arguing about. But more important is the reason now, and this is your trajectory point or Adam's trajectory point, the reason now that we know why eugenics is you know, such an appalling idea is because they went through it and thought about it and interrogated it and we all came out the other side. So you, you, you can't, as it were, just go back and see uh, individual beliefs or theories, mad or wicked as they now seem, uh, you can't see them on their own. They're part of a process in which, you know, society for the last three, four, five thousand years has been interrogating what is it to have a better community. And sometimes they went down terrible blind alleys and sometimes they didn't. I think that comes back to that critical point. It's about what people did, not what they thought. And I, I'm, I'm, I don't care what Cecil Rhodes said about race uh, or, or about Africans. I care about what he did. I care about the militarized police force that was unleashed against the Endebele. So this, and, and I think it's a, it's a dangerous trap to be uh, channeled down this avenue that it's about what people said. And then you can get quotes from one side or the other. It's about what people did. I don't care what Edward Colston's views on Africans were. I care about the 19,000 people that died in the holds of the slave ships of the Royal African Company. And okay. I think that's that specificity, that it's about actions. You know, the eugenics point, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is a perfect you know, case in point. Lots of people supported eugenics, but when you get to people who are involved in uh, the TAFE 4 program in Germany, the euthanized people, the euthanized mixed race descendants of the African, the African American soldiers on the Rhineland, I don't want to get used to them, to people who carried these things out, people who thought what we now know are horrible thoughts. That's a very different matter. Yeah. Well, I, I, could, I, I could carry on chair. I mean, I, I, I've had to do virtually no work at all because you've both been so brilliant. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. I think there's going to be a great deal of demand for, uh, for us to bring you back together again in the future. Um, we'll try and have a round that time. I'll find a more incendiary subject. Yeah, that sounds like it really, you know. <laughs> it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, if you're watching along today, do head over to the RSA website now where you'll find links to Mary and David's terrific books, including Mary's Women and Power and David's Black and British, A Forgotten History. And a reminder that you can catch the landmark Civilization series that they co-hosted on BBC iPlayer, where you'll also find a number of David's powerful documentaries on Black British history, alongside the latest series, of the brilliant A House Through Time. If you've been inspired by today's discussion, do let us know what you think. The conversation will continue on Twitter, but politely, please, on the hashtag RSA Bridges and across the RSA website, where you can find out more about our research, which includes a 2020 update of the Heritage Index, which maps local heritage assets and activities nationwide to understand and build the relationship between people, place, and community power. And of course, on the website, you'll also find information on how you can get involved in making change happen as part of our growing global fellowship community. Finally, thank you again to Mary Beard and David Olishoga, and thank you all for watching.